probably knows, but if you don't, Marinda is one of the best long course triathletes in the sport today. You have over 20 victories in the 70.3 distance, including the 70.3 world champion in uh, 2007. Yep. And 2010, you won Kona, uh -huh. setting a run course record of 256.51. Is that right? No, 52. 250. 256.52. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, 252. 252. All right. Something. So that's about what, 6, <laughs> 638, 640 per mile? Just for reference, she doesn't know, but it's really, really fast. Um, so tonight, we're going to keep things pretty informal. We're going to chat with her about her training. Um, she's been generous enough to share with us a power file from one of her bike workouts. So we're going to take a look at that also. And of course, we're going to um, cover the methods you use to recover from your day-to-day -day training, which allows her to be fighting for titles in uh, September and October. So uh, first, first thing I want to talk about is your season so far. Uh, last year, you were third in Kona, mm -hmm. and then five, six weeks later, you went to uh, Ironman Florida where you placed second. Mm -hmm. So you haven't had to do an Ironman yet this year. So how's that played into your season planning, and how's the season been for you so far? Yeah, I mean, it was awesome to be able to go and do Florida. Um, having won in 2010 uh, to re-qualify for Kona, all, all I needed to do was finish an Ironman. So I had the luxury, I guess, of just going and, and finishing one. I had no pressure in Florida, or actually didn't know if I'd take 15 hours to finish it and just cruise it in, but I really kind of wanted to get my off-season going, so I um, ended up finishing second to Von Van Blerken, who actually broke the course record that day, so I um, was pretty pleased with, with that effort, and it was, it was three weeks after Kona, so I was really surprised that my body you know, was strong enough to handle another Ironman so close um, after Kona. Um, so yeah, this year I had a nice off-season, um, um, some downtime, I take my off-season pretty seriously, I like to put on a little extra weight and uh, really enjoy myself so that I'm fresh when I come back um, early in the year. I had a good off season. Um, I went down to Australia for Christmas, uh, spent a bit of time with my family. January, February, March, we were in um, Australia training, um, trying to avoid the winter here in, in, in Colorado, but uh, we ended up getting a lot of rain. Um, so. I mean, it was warm rain, so I can't really Better complain. Better than our snow. My fiance did not love it so much, but I, um, I, don't, I mean, I love Australia, so I was happy to be there. Sure. Um, and then I, I sort of had a rough start to the season. Um, San Juan was my first race, and I crashed my bike. Um, I don't know how, because I was going in a straight line on a highway, and I guess I hit a bump and went over the handlebars. It was on the ground. So it was uh, my first crash in a race, such would, my last, hopefully. Um, and so that kind of... I finished the race, but um, lived across the, across the line there, and then um, a couple of other results were kind of touching, you know, touch and go. Not really what I had expected or what I'd hoped, to, um, but my training's really been on track. I, I feel like I'm in good shape, and all the indicators are there in training, and um, that's kind of what I look at when I'm preparing for Kona. I sort of, I always like to see results in races because you want to you want to see your work in action. Uh, but at the end of the day, I know that the training that I've done and the training that I'm doing is, is right on track to do well in Kona. So hopefully, fingers crossed, um, you know, I've got 10 weeks or nine and a half weeks now till Kona. And um, hopefully everything keeps progressing the way it has been. And hopefully I'll be ready to, ready, ready to rumble on 12th of October. All right. So what, I guess, what currently <laughs> what phase of training would you say you're in now? I'm in, like, basically the, the big push for Kona, um, so as I said, nine and a half weeks out. So uh, I'll do a race five weeks out from Kona, I'm gonna do Muskoka 70.3, um, and that's kind of uh, a way for me to you know, rest up and give myself a little break. So I sort of do four weeks of really hard training, take an easier week, do a race, and then by then I pretty much should be ready to go. Um, but again, there's five more weeks till Kona, I'll have a couple of easy days, hit probably two more decent weeks, and then the last three weeks, you're not really pushing anymore. You kind of, um, you're not really resting up yet either. You're kind of just getting in a couple of last sessions, but it's more for feel than okay. to try and gain any more fitness. And how far out will you travel to Kona? I always go out um, to Kona two weeks before the race. I like to go in like a Friday, two weeks out, so that I can have a decent weekend of training on the course in the heat. Um, I've always been told that it takes about 10 days for your sweat rates to change. So coming from here in Colorado, um, you know, where it's dry and possibly cooler uh, in, you know, late um, 
uh, late September, yeah. you want to get in the heat uh, if you can. Uh, so I like to go out two weeks and generally it's worked well <laughs> for yeah. me right. in the last four years. So um, yeah, that's sort of the plan I, I like to follow. Okay. So within your training, how, how is it structured? Do you do you do an even amount of swim bike run throughout the year, or do you follow a block where you say like focus on your bike and just maintain the bike or the run and the swim? Um, I, I guess for me, the bike has been a, a pretty big focus um, in the last few years, just because you know I feel that as our sport evolves, the girls are getting so much faster on the on the bike, and you can make. I mean, it's a hundred. 112 mile bike ride, you can lose a lot of time, or you can make up a lot of time. And um, you know, I felt that you know my run was where it needed to be. I'd certainly still like to improve my run, but you know, I think the place that I could maybe make up the most time is the bike. Uh, so I've sort of been just generally throughout the year focusing maybe more on my bike. And um, you never want to let go of your strength, so you never want to neglect whatever gift you have, whether it's swimming, cycling, running, you never want to completely forget about it. So I'm always making sure I'm giving the run attention. But um, I guess for me, I, I feel that I can get the most time from the bike. So it's probably been given a little more attention than, okay. than the run. And has that translated to necessarily more volume or more intensity? Or what, is, what does that look like for you building on the bike? Um, you know, it's it's been just being more specific. Um, so paying you know, more attention to detail, I'm using training peaks now, and I'm using a power meter um, just to plot um, my progress. Okay. Uh, whereas before, I never used a power meter. I raced on feel and, um, and looked at my cadence. Okay. And um, it worked very well, yeah. um, and it can work for many people, but I've found that I, I really wanted to just be more focused on what I was doing and maybe a little bit more of a scientific approach as well. So. Uh, I think that's helped. Um, I've seen improvements, and it's nice to see, be able to look at the numbers and say, well, a year ago, at, you know, this in this block, I could only hold X number of watts for a 20-minute effort, and now I can hold, you know, a little more, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so I think it's been good to to see that progress. How much do you look at those numbers? Have you be, I mean, maybe you haven't quite become a full data geek, but how much are you really looking at those numbers, especially when they're good numbers and you're you're able to see improvement? You know, I don't really read into the numbers a lot. I have key sessions. So same with my run. Uh, I don't always wear the Garmin when I go out running. I like to go run just with a stopwatch and not know how fast or slow I'm running and run by feel. Um, same goes for cycling. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, I turn the power meter off. I don't want to know, you know, if my watts are 50 or 100 or, or great, you know. But when I have those key sessions, they're the sessions that I'll come home and download and want to see progress in. So um, I certainly, you know, in run sessions we have like, uh, we call them key sessions or test sets that I'll do throughout the year at, at different points. And um, it's it's good to have those sessions as markers mm -hmm. so that you can hopefully see progress. Okay. Um, so like I said before, Rennie's been kind enough to let us uh, take a look at one of her uh, bike power files. So we're going to do that right now. So as you can see, um, up there, that's the description. It's a pretty, pretty basic looking set. Now, this is something that looks like it's easy on paper, but I'll bet when you go out and you do it, it it's not. Do you have a lot of sets like that? You're like, oh, okay, I can do that. And then you get out there and you're like, wait a minute, this is a little bit more than I thought. Um, well, I think I've done this for a long time now that I know what I'm in for. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's meant to be hard, you know. I think uh, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, so. Right. Um, and that, you know, that's what it takes to, to be the best, and I'm willing to, to do that. Okay. So this is uh, actually... So, uh, you can see, obviously, we've got um, the pink line is her watts. Now, I noticed that there's no heart rate monitor on here. So you typically, when you ride the bike, you're not having the heart rate. You're just going um, with wattage. Yes. Okay. I just wonder if that was a consistent thing, if you just kind of forgot it that day. No. All right. Um, so the yellow line is uh, her RPMs, and you've got uh, speed on there, and the uh, green here is the uh, elevation. So really the main thing we want to look at here are the 2 by 30 minute sessions and then that final 15 minute uh, time trial. So here we zoom into the first 30 minute session, and the main thing is we want to look at these numbers here uh, off to the right. So here you have your duration. And the big thing is, is the normalized power right here, that's 193 watts. 
So that's what she was doing in that uh, session. Now, for you, during this, what kind of effort level would you put that at? Is that Iron Man pace, or what percentage would you um, give that? Yeah, it's probably around Iron Man effort. Okay. Um, and again, um, I'm, I'm looking at the watts more after the session mm -hmm. than during the session. So, you know, you giving what you can on that day, because obviously there's a lot of buildup of fatigue, you've maybe done a run session or whatever before. But um, for these sessions, I'm sort of trying to push the way I would push in Kona. Okay. So that's kind of what I, for, for a 30 minute. Right. Uh, right. So what's, it, what's actually amazing about that, you say you're not looking at the watts. So that, what amazes me about this is, so if you look underneath the, the VI, that's also the variability index. So what that is, is basically how smooth was she riding during that 30 minutes. So if you have a rider that spikes and then coasts, you're going to get a really high variability index of maybe 1.08 or 1.09. So 1.01, that's incredibly smooth. Um, so you obviously have a lot of experience in just being able to go at a single pace and keep that rhythm. Um, is that something that you think has served you well in Kona? Absolutely. I mean, I, I didn't even know what that number was. <laughs> and that, that's what's impressive, right? No thanks. That, well, that, that's what makes her, you know, a world champion, is that that's just something that naturally occurs. So that's impressive. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, again, I've, I've been doing the sport for a long time. Yeah. I think that just evolves over time. And yep. The more you race, the more you can kind of just dial in a certain effort sure. um, and, and stay there. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Well, and then it gets better because she goes and does the next 30 minutes. This is the second 30 minute session. And you notice that the numbers are almost exactly the same. Her normalized power is up by two watts, and the variability index, again, is 1.01. .01. So, um, it obviously it just comes naturally. And you're, um, you can't see it, it's, unfortunately it's blocked there, but on the, um, this is a file from a quark and it has left-right power balance. And your power balance is almost right at 50-50. Is that something you've ever looked at or? I actually only started riding with power a year and a half ago maybe. And um, I got, yeah, that's when I, actually I only got the quark a year ago. Okay. Um, and so, but it's not something that I look at you know, I look at it from time to time because I was like, oh, I wonder if one leg's stronger than the other, but I've seen sort of very similar numbers, right. so I was... So it's not something you need to work on because yeah. <laughs> just like the variability index, you just naturally have yeah. it. So then the final session is this 15-minute TT. So again, you were looking here, normalized power has gone up, that's 204, and the variability index has gone, if it was possible to get any better than 1.01, .01, it did, it went to 1.00. <laughs> So what are you gaining in this 15 minute session? Because I think a lot of people think, well, it's just a 15 minute interval, but what are you gaining out of that within this workout? A lot of my, the training I do is about putting yourself under fatigue, so putting yourself under load, mm -hmm. and then doing the hard work. So you want to be able to hold form under fatigue. Um, and I've found that that sort of training in my run and in the cycling has really served me well. So um, yeah, just basically trying to crush myself. Okay, uh, and you, you mentioned earlier that you look, you do often look at cadence, and your cadence for these is, is almost exactly right at 80 to 81. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of look at 90. Is that something you've looked at in terms of within trying to um, raise your cycling level? Is cadence something you've, you've checked out? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely have played around with cadence a little bit. Certainly at the beginning of last year, I started to up my cadence, uh, but I found that I'm better or more efficient at lower 80s than I am at higher 80s, okay. um, it, it feels more comfortable to me. So instead of, I mean, I could probably put out more power at a higher cadence, but what is that going to take away? Because you're using your engine, your, your heart and lungs a lot more. Mm -hmm. And for me, I like to save that for the run. <laughs> okay. So I'm using a lot of strength uh, for the cycle um, and maybe a little bit less heart and lungs. And then on the run, somehow it works. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they can take away somehow it works, yeah. but uh, okay. Low cadence on the bike, high cadence on the run. It works. No, that's your selling point. Yeah. So, um, now when you, so you said maybe this is a, a key sort of session for you. Is this, is this a session that you do often or how does it vary for you? You're like, how do you see progress within this session? Um, this is a session that I probably would do a similar session to this maybe once a week. Right. Um, and the progression on this one would be um, at the end of a you know a long ride. So I'd ride four hours and then I'd do the last 
hour or 45 minutes hard and that would be as hard as I can go um, rather than just that Ironman pace. Generally it, under that sort of fatigue it's probably a little bit faster than Ironman pace but not much. Okay. Um, so yeah that's kind of and that mentally and physically has served me well in Kona. So I always feel like the last 50k I, I make the turn back onto the quick k and I'm like all right well it's the last hour or just over an hour and I ride hard in every long ride in the last hour and it's worked really well and um, I mean I don't have a lot of scientific background um, <laughs> but we you know I've tried this in the past and um, yeah, it's worked really well in races so is, is there a course here in Boulder that you tend to do often that simulates that, that last uh, 30 or 40 miles? Um, in Boulder, I mean, if you want to ride the, 30, the 36, yeah. the ride back into town on the 36 is, is tough. And it's uh, probably a little bit tougher than um, Kona, certainly the first part of the 36. But um, a ride I actually normally do, I'll do uh, the Estes Park, so um, Loveland up to up Big Thompson through Glenhaven, Estes Park, down the 36 or down the 7, and then I'll do a time trial out sort of Hygiene Way and then home uh, 75th. So that's a, pretty big, that's a pretty big day for you. Do, you. do you run off the bike in a session like that? Because you're talking about how um, within Kona, you know, the last hour, and then obviously you're going to go run after. So what, in terms of the run after a bike like this, are you looking at just a 15 minute sort of run to kind of get used to it, or do you believe in, or have you found for yourself that a longer run off a longer bike, more race simulation? I wouldn't put my shoes on for less than 30 minutes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it depends. Like earlier on in my prepar preparation, it might be an easy 40 minute run off the bike. And then once I get fitter and I can handle it, it'll be uh, maybe a 5K at, at pace. Um, then that will progress. I mean, there's a session that um, Crowley and I and, and Tim do every year, and it's well documented. You can look it up online. Ten one milers. We do that session, and then we do ten one milers off the bike, and that's probably that's the max we would ever do. Okay. Um, and we do that once um, in our preparation for Kona. Um, how, so how, far out, of, how far out would that session be? Probably eight weeks. Okay. Yeah. So it's a lot of time to recover from a big session like that. Yeah, and then you know. We'll do a, normally, typically, we do that. We'd do a race, and then I'd do another similar session to that, but it wouldn't be as the run would be, you know, shorter and and not as, you know, not as uh, intense. Okay. Um, the final taper week in Kona. How how do you manage the stress of that that whole entire week? I mean, obviously, you have sponsorship obligations. You're trying to get everything ready, obviously, for that day, and you just kind of think everybody. You just kind of want to get to that day. Mm -hmm. Where do you go almost mentally to kind of deal with that, that final push? Yeah, I mean, I've got two fantastic managers, Wendy Ingram and Shannon Delaney, who helped me a lot um, race week. You know, I've, I've got some fantastic sponsors, and they want to see you on race week. Um, and you, you know, you obviously want to give them, give back as much as you can, but you need to save energy. And every time you go out that door, it's mayhem. Um, but I think for me, the, for the most part, I enjoy the excitement. I enjoy the build. Uh, you know, race week comes around, and every day there's more excitement. You just feel it in the air. That there's more people coming into town. Everybody's ripped. Um, you know, from this 80-year-old down, you know, to the, you know, you know, the 20-year-olds. Everybody looks just unbelievable, um, in the best shape of their life, getting ready to race Kona. Maybe it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So. There's just a lot of excitement, and you know the island itself is a pretty special place. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I kind of thrive off that energy, um, and uh, you know I certainly try to keep it all in. And you you know you're hiding in your room a lot of the time, and um, you kind of go out and do your appearances and sort of your training, and then get back straight back in you know into the rooms, feet up on the couch. Um, but I, I mean, for me, I, I enjoy the whole experience. I enjoy the excitement. I enjoy the hype. Um, that's what gets me up to race at that level. Okay. So obviously you have a, a tremendous workload to go and, and attempt to, to win another world title. <clears throat> so when you come in the door after doing a huge ride and a 40-minute you know, run, what does your recovery routine look like? We get the chocolate milk straight away. <laughs> um, we have a chocolate milk lady that comes every two weeks um, and drops off about 2,600 mil bottles of chocolate milk. So Do you have a separate like chocolate? milk refrigerator? We don't. We need one. Yeah. 
here? Yeah. <laughs> like a commercial one, you know? And like, you just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should have that, but we don't. <laughs> yeah, we should. <laughs> but I'll put it on the red street for the wedding. That'd be great. Yeah, um, we, you know, typically we'll, it depends. Um, we might add ice cream to the chocolate milk or some extra protein. <laughs> Brilliant. And whiz it up and maybe a little ice and it's a delicious treat. And we have, we have that as soon as we walk in the door within 10 minutes. Um, and then we probably lay on the ground for a while. <laughs> then go take a shower and then get some real food in. Um, some, I, I always go with the eggs, um, you know, toast, anything I can find. Is there is there anything specific within maybe your your day to day diet that you either avoid or try to get in that you feel on that on that daily basis gets you ready for the next session? Ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> that's as good an answer as any. <laughs> no, I think for the most part, when you're training, you know, as many hours as we are, especially in this block, it's it's a lot of time training, and the the battle is to get in the calories. Um, it's very hard to replace what you what you put out, so you know, taking the chocolate milk, drinking, eating ice cream in the evenings, that saves you from waking up at 2 a.m. starving. Um, yeah, I mean, in this stage of preparation, we're, we're eating a lot, we're trying to maybe take on as many calories as we can because you really need to refuel. If you don't put the calories in, you're gonna pay for it the next day, um, and you know, it's going to spiral. Yeah. Um, so, Super important to get the calories in. Um, probably the last five weeks I cut ice cream, which sucks. <laughs> but, uh, no more ice cream and no more red wine. Um, but That's tough. Yeah. <laughs> you should see how we've got a massive like Eurocave wine, wine fridge at our house too. That I, it's in the lounge room. So I have to neglect the wine fridge and the freezer. I'm, I can always come over for dinner like, during that five week period and help you out with that. So. Yeah, you, you cannot because we're not opening wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's that one. So, so with, okay, so there are a lot of different brands of chocolate milk. Which one, if you, when you reach for it, which is the one that you like the most? Ooh, I'm a carton guy myself. Anything in the carton I like. We get a true move for free, so that's what we drink. All right. <laughs> That's, that's good enough. Hey, but any chocolate milk, I mean, you know, we get, go to Whole Foods and um, the one in the, like, in the, the glass mm. container. Okay. Anything that's in the glass container is it's good. You know it's, it's good. It's true. Um, so, yeah, we might get that one, but um, our fridge is already stocked with true moves, so we don't need to buy it. How, di how disappointed is it, though, when you have to, like, buy one from a gas station? Oh, You're yeah. like, I got so much at home, but I really want it right now. Yeah. That's got to be upsetting. Yeah, at least it's not in Australia. In Australia, it'd be like five bucks for a chocolate milk. <laughs> yeah, it's expensive. You need wow. to take a credit card on your long rides in Australia. Okay. So, you know. so okay. So beyond nutrition, there are a lot of other recovery methods out there. Um, which, which others do you use? Yeah, um, Normatec. Um, okay. We use the boots in. If, if you haven't seen, we kind of we have a, a set here actually in Training Peaks, but I don't, we kind of refer to them as the space boots. Yeah. So it's. Kind of you zip it up, it goes all the way up your leg, and then they, they fill with air. There's different chambers, they fill with air, and they kind of have their own... Uh, they kind of flush. Yeah, they flush your legs out. They're pretty amazing. So you have some of those at home. We've got some Norma Tech boots at home. We also have Compex um, unit as well. Okay. And that sort of similar idea. Um, there's a recovery setting on there, so you can... That's kind of one we'd more use on the go, because it's such a small unit. Right. So if we're traveling, uh, we take that. Uh, and massage is key. Um, in this block, I, I probably have two massages a week. I know a lot of other athletes, I won't match, mention any names, some of the older pros, they like to have massage daily um, in this block. Um, and that's where I'm headed, but <laughs> two a week is good for now. Um, so going into Kona <laughs> this year, um, obviously I'm assuming the objective is to, to take home another world title. <clears throat> You're back working with Siri Lindley this year. How is that? You feel uh, do you feel more prepared this year? Or what has been any? Have there been any key differences that you feel maybe this is this is definitely going to be my year? You never really know if it's going to be your year or not. I mean, I didn't know it was going to be my year in 2010, and I had the race of my life. Um, and in 2011, I didn't think I was in any sort of shape, and I came within two minutes of Chrissy um, at the end of the race. So. 
you never know. I mean, it's so, I, everything looks good, everything looks on track. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm in great shape, mm -hmm. as good a shape as I've ever been before at this stage, um, maybe even better shape. But you've got to get it right on that day. And there's so many factors that come into getting it right on that day. I mean, I'm sure all of you have gotten to a race and been like, I've been training amazingly well. Why aren't the results there? And sometimes they're just not there yet. Um, so I, I feel confident, I, you know, but you can never feel overly confident for that race because it's a crazy race. Thing, yeah. Weird things happen. Yeah. Um, being back with Siri has been amazing. Um, it was good for me to step away for like a year and a half and uh, do it on my own for a little while and, and, and talk to some different people and get some different opinions. Um, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> for me, she's the best partner for, for me as a, you know, we're the best team, I think, and uh, I think we have a, a good shot at, at, at going very fast and coming. All right. Uh, how would you rate yourself as far as, how easy an athlete are you to coach? I think I'm really easy. <laughs> what would Siri say? Uh, um, I, she would say I'm easy, I think. Um, I, I mean, I've touched wood, never had an injury, so don't have to worry about that. Um, I never miss a session. Um, I, you know, I guess, I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I challenge her on things, but I think any great athlete does. You know, you, you put so much into what you're doing, <clears throat> pardon me, that you need to, you're not just going to sit there and after doing the sport for 10 years and just do what you're told. Right. You know, for the most part, we always come to an agreement. But, um, you know, I have my say and she has her say. And um, as I said, we work really well together and there's never any anger or it's always very uh, positive. And, um, you know, we both have one goal and that's to win Kona. And, um, you know, we do whatever it takes to get there. Right. All right, well, I think that's pretty much everything that I had. So if anyone out there has uh, any questions you'd like to ask Miranda, we'd, uh, we're certainly opening up the floor and we have uh, some questions from the from our social media feed as well, but who wants to go first? Who wants to ask the first question? Chance of a lifetime. Yeah, go for it, great. Do you use any nutritional supplements, like I mean, for your daily, you know, and you're trying to get that in shape, but also even for recovery? I use a protein powder called Ascend. It's like from Australia. Uh, I started using it a few years ago. Um, when I started doing Ironman, I realized I needed extra, extra protein. So, um, yeah, the, the more endurance events you do, the more protein you need to absorb and take in. So um, I add that um, sometimes into my chocolate milk um, after most harder sessions. Um, <clears throat> other than that, I don't really take, I mean, I take multivitamin, I take magnesium, and magnesium powder. Um, and a lot of vitamin C just because we're always on the edge of sickness um, but that's really it um, just try and have a really healthy balanced diet and eat real foods for the most part yeah. do you prefer to train with training partners or do you do the majority of your sessions solo I enjoy training with training partners but I do most of my key sessions solo so any I do most of my running solo unless um, I'm out running with my fiance Tim um, but for the most part, I run by myself. Cycling is much more fun with a couple other people, but or I like smaller groups because I don't want to just be sitting on and not doing any work all day. So um, usually maybe one or two other people um, or a group of four is ideal. Um, and then swimming, I swim with a group. Swimming by yourself is not fun at all. <laughs> with, I'm sorry, within that real quickly, how much of your bike is done on a road bike and how much is it specific on a tri bike? Probably 98% on the tri bike. Oh, okay. Right. right here, right up front. Do you have a fast transition? Do I have a fast transition? I, I think I do. <laughs> do, do you want to race me? <laughs> I think, I think we can set it up. We can make it happen. <laughs> we got a parking lot. It's, important, it's important to have a fast transition. So keep working on that. It's free speed. Yeah. Right there. I was just curious in your biking, how much hill work you do versus just flat, continuous power output kind of training. Are you talking like intervals on hills or just climb? Like well, if you if if you focus on the fact that the climbing is hard and that's 
something that you would do to get the fitness or if it's just the exertion level going faster on flat ground and the consistency of a flat ground ride? I, I actually prefer the consistency of a hill climb, especially around here. Um, and we always make sure we do one big hilly ride a week. Um, but it's sometimes we'll have intervals on the hill, but a lot of the time it'll just be social and you'll be getting the watts. So you'll be getting that constant power output without even having to, it's not a mental um, drain because you know it's beautiful out there and you're out with friends, but the watts are high. So um, absolutely, um, especially around here, the, <coughs> the, the climbing's amazing and the roads are great. So definitely try and get out once a week. We're back. Um, besides Kona, how much race specific training do you do? I know earlier the question was asked, is there anything around here that mimics the wheat cage as you're coming up? Um, I know you have other races throughout the year. Do you do any race specific training besides Kona? Um, so do I prepare like Kona for any other races? I guess so, yeah. Uh, mm, well, I mean, any race that's coming up, it's important. I, I don't tow the line unless I'm towing to try and race to be competitive. Uh, so I don't really believe in A, B and C races. I try every time I step on the line, I'm trying to win if I can. Uh, but I'm not going to be in the best shape. I'm going to be in getting ready for Kona shape throughout the year. Um, race, there's a race in June that I do that's super hilly, so I'll go make sure I do like a couple of hillier runs. Uh, I mean, there's subtle differences for different um, different courses. Uh, if I've got a flat race coming up, I'd do more time trialing on the flat. Um, but for the most part, everything really revolves around Kona. So I, I, you know, I mean, this block especially, but throughout the year, I'm really just trying to, the last block I was trying to get to a fitness level so that I could handle this block of training um, without breaking down. And then this block of training <coughs> is the biggest block of the year. Um, and then, you know, I guess we're nine and a half weeks out. so. Yeah, it's kind of all a progression throughout the year for, for Kona. I don't know if I answered your question oh, adequately. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. From a <laughs> mental aspect, where do you go during a race, whether it's Kona or, you know, what are you thinking of? Do you try to blur it out? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole race is about pain management. So sure. you're kind of trying to um, push as hard as you can to whatever limit you can. Um, but having said that, I think the best way to block the pain is to focus on the little things. Uh, keep it really simple. Um, focus on your breathing, focus on your form, um, or look at, you know, I will always look at my cadence on the bike and just, just focus on that. Keep focusing, focusing on that. Um, and that sort of gets you through the race a lot easier than, um, I mean, there's gonna be voices in the back of your head all, all day, but you need to silence those voices. <laughs> as best you can, and that's the battle we have out there all day, so um, focusing on the little things I think is the best way to to, uh, to quiet the voices. Thank you. Yeah. I've got a few questions from the Twitter sphere. Okay. Uh, yeah. Twitter uh, questions, all right. Yeah. So I'll throw a couple your way. <laughs> as a strong runner, uh, you've talked about your bike cadence a lot. Do you focus on a certain cadence for your run? Yeah, I actually do. Um, we work on cadence a lot. Uh, I try to run around 100 cadence on the road and wow. a little higher on the treadmill. And obviously as you fatigue, it, it slows down. But uh, ideally, 100 would be my ideal. If I could hold that for a Kona, I'd, I think I'd go. Wow, that's... <laughs> um, another question, what's more important, volume or intensity? I think intensity is more important. Um, but having said that, if you're doing an Ironman, you do need to go out and do some <laughs> some volume. Um, you know, if you're 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 short on time, then certainly don't go and run 30 minutes easy. Go do some intervals. It's going to always be you know more bang for your buck. Great, thanks. How about uh, other than hiring a coach or increased pool time, what's the quickest way to improve your swim? Uh, when you find out, can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Let me reply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so no uh, magical advice on no, that? No, I mean, I do, um, I use the, like a swim cords. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, a swim cord with a bench called a, the halo, 
and it has like um, like a it, yeah, it's, I know what you mean. It's, it's almost a like cardboard. Shape. It's like a foam, and it's kind of almost, almost semi-circle, so your hands have to have clear to it so it really holds on high elbow. Um, so I use the Halo trainer, you know, a couple of times a week, so for a bit of strength, but it's, I don't know, it's it's a progress. Swimming is just, you've got to just do it. Great, and then the last question again uh, on running. Were you naturally a, <laughs> a high cadence runner, or what would you do to improve or focus on improving your run? Uh, I think, well, I'm kind of short, <laughs> so my little stumpy legs, if they want to go fast, if I want to go fast, need to turn over sort of fast, so maybe I'm sort of natural at it, but I think what has helped me increase my cadence is running on the treadmill. Um, I like to run on the treadmill once a week or once at least once every two weeks, um, and I found that that helps keep your cadence at a, you know, at a high level. Uh, do you have a favorite race venue? Yes, it would have to be Phuket, Thailand. Best race in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly because the drinks are like two dollars. <laughs> and is that the adult beverages? <laughs> yes. And then the, the, you can get massage on the beach for like five bucks. Like, so good. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And we, we have another one as well from Twitter, I believe. It's, uh, what are your tips from someone moving from the Olympic distance to the 70.3 distance? Well, first of all, good job starting with the Olympic. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people like to just go straight for Ironman, so I, um, I think that you're doing the right thing in making that step. And to be honest, the, the half is not that much different to the Olympic. I mean, for the most part, if you're doing the right training for Olympic distance, you'll be fine in a half. Add in a little bit of extra time on your long run. Added a little bit of extra time on your on your long bike. But other than that, you're pretty golden, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anyone on the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. Do you do any other training besides like run, like strength or yoga or uh, kickboxing? Are you, you a crossfitter? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I do uh, like a little bit of strength, but it's not really strength. It's more like functional movement. So getting out of the plane that we're in all the time. Um, and that's more just to keep everything balanced. Um, but I'm not lifting weights. I'm not trying to grow any more muscles. So I want to stay light. <laughs> and I don't have the energy to go and do anything else. <laughs> I may have missed it, but are you going to race with power in Kona? I'm not going to race with power okay. in Kona. Um, just race the race? Yeah, I just race the race. I mean, I, I, I get too attached to the numbers instead of just racing. So I'm I'm a kind of an emotional racer, I guess. And I need to just forget about that, do what I've got to do and push as hard as I can. I mean, I've, I've always raced by feel. So um, at this point, I'm still using power in training um, and I'm watching it in training, but I'm not ready to use it in a race. Yeah. yeah no. How many races do you do a It depends on the year. Um, now that you have to do two Ironman a year, uh, that cuts it down. I used to do like 16 races a year before I was doing Ironman. Now with the two Ironman events, probably six or seven other races in the year. Two of them would be Olympic and maybe five halves. Um, so I mean, it's still a decent amount, but uh, that might taper off, you know, in the next few years. But uh, those Ironman races take it out of you, so you need to make sure you look after your body and take the time necessary to recover afterwards and um, let your body heal. How long is your recovery time after Kona or Florida? <laughs> well, if you had to like go into a season, you had like another race, maybe three or four months out, how long would you give yourself? Because I think a lot of age groupers they might that are doing two Ironmans a year, they're spacing them out as much as they can, but still. Yeah, you know, I actually, I haven't really had to race another Ironman. Like, I, as I said, I raced three weeks after Kona, but that was more of just go and do it and get it done. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really seriously tried to do two Ironman back to back in like a space of time. So for the most part, I do Kona and then I'm done for the year, have my off season. And then uh, the last couple of years, I did an Ironman in like March. So that's like six months. Okay. Yeah, in the back. So on that note, how long is your off season? 
<laughs> yeah, well, I eat ice cream all year, so. Um, except for five weeks before COVID. Um, my off season is, I mean, I take two weeks completely off. A lot of athletes won't do that. I mean, I don't do anything uh, for two weeks. And then I have two weeks of kind of moving. Um, and I have to swim because I wasn't a swimmer growing up. I started sport when I was 18 and swimming is just so not normal. Like, you're not, I mean, you walk around everywhere, you're on your legs, so you're using your legs, but you're never really using those muscles in everyday life. So it's one of those things where you, to keep your feel, you, I need to be in the water. So I'll, you know, hop in the water in the second two week block. Um, but other than that, I can do what I want. I can just, I just try to be a little bit more active, get the heart rate going. Um, and then after that, um, probably for a month, I'm on like a restricted plan. So I'm on like a, a program for five days of the week and two days I do what I want. Um, and then I'm into a serious training, so. Yeah. Talk to us about how you see your Stayed uninjured from all the use of your body. Well, I think, um, as I said, I, I really do. One of the best best things that I was ever told when I started this, you know, going long, doing halves, was from my coach, Siri Lindley, and she said, "Look after your body. You know, you ha only have one. Treat it nice." <laughs> so I've always been very careful in making sure I'm not over racing or overreaching in training. And if I feel something that's hurting, I'll rest it. <laughs> so um, I listen to my body, but I think on top of that, I mean, there are a bunch of athletes that, that do that. On top of that, I think I'm just lucky. Um, I have short limbs, I think that helps as well. <laughs> um, but I, I think I have good biomechanics when I run and, and that's, you know, most people are, get injured or stress fractures through running, so. I think I'm just kind of lucky and I have a great coach and, um, and I listen to my body. Do you think having played a lot of other sports growing up and doing things that are in other places, you, you were a pretty, pretty decent basketball player mm -hmm. in your younger years, right? Yeah. Do you think maybe some of that has helped so you're not always working in one plane, mm -hmm. just eight Yeah, years? I mean, that's definitely, um, I, I think, contributed to the reason that I'm able to, to be healthy. Uh, I played basketball for 11 years, from when I was seven till 18, and that's when I started triathlon. So, I, and I, you know, I did all sorts of sports: um, triathlon, touch football, kung fu. Um, never did any single. I never ran, cycled, or swam um, until I was 18. Uh, and I think that all those directional tra changes kind of gave me a really good structure to work from. Um, but that's a theory. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I mean, that seems sort of to make sense. Crowey played soccer <laughs> a lot, and he's a good runner. Doesn't yeah. seem to have a whole lot of injuries, so I think, yeah. I think that works. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Marinda. Really appreciate yeah. your time. And uh, we're going to have a lot more events like this. So you can uh, check them out on our Facebook page. And I uh, hope to see you guys back here at Training Peaks Headquarters. Thank you.